We're delighted today to have with us, as I mentioned, missionaries Rick and Stacy Perry, missionaries to Botswana. The Perrys were in Botswana for some 15 years. They left in 2007, came back to the States, and then they planted a church in New Haven, Connecticut. They went there as Metro missionaries, which are how we ended up in Olathe. They were doing the same thing, and in fact, I actually really, I think, first met him because I knew he loved home missions or church planting because he had been there and done that, so he actually got a call from me to partner with us, and they faithfully partnered with us to help plant Cross Church, and God has, after 14 years, has called them to go back to the nation of Botswana, and we want to be a blessing to them. They're going to be a blessing to us. Brother Perry, would you come? Why don't you welcome the man of God to the pulpit? My goodness. I love going to church. Mm. I love going to church. Amen. I meant to get up here and say, I'm a Medimo Bakwe. Buona Safiwe. Glory adios. Praise the Lord for the rest of us. Amen. It is good to be in the house of God. I, if you would like to be seated, you may be seated. If you want to stand the entire time, it won't disturb me one bit. Amen. But it is so good to be here. And if you are a guest here today, can I just say you're in the right place. You have found a great church with a great pastor and pastor's family. And uh, my goodness, I didn't know the skills. Uh, I leaned over to my wife. I said, that girl can play and she can sing. Amen. And uh, I'll leave the pastor alone. He... He plays with buttons good. I'm wondering what what will happen if I start pushing. Probably shouldn't do that. I, I uh, yeah. Anyway, but uh, it is so good to be here. I'm gonna try to be as time conscious as possible. I cannot promise that God will do the same, but I am believing for a move of the Holy Ghost here today. And if you're here and you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, today would be a good day for that to happen. Amen. But I do believe that before we leave here today, God's going to speak to each of us. I believe we're going to leave here encouraged, excited about living for God. Amen. Amen. 31 years ago, I made a phone call to a friend who was getting married. And I was friends with both her and her soon-to-be husband. And my plan was to communicate with her, let her know I would not be able to make the wedding, but that I was hoping to be there the next weekend and wanted to be able to spend some time with them. And that conversation never happened because the love of my life answered the phone and I didn't even know it until about five minutes in. That very first phone call lasted about 50 minutes to an hour. I actually asked her, Pastor, what ring she wanted on that first phone call. I had no clue what she looked like. This was before Facebook. This was before all that stuff. Even this thing called email, I didn't have. It was terrifying, but I'm thankful that she said yes, and she's traveled the world with me or me with her, but she was raised in Tanzania, Africa. She does speak Swahili. I'm still a little bitter because when her family gets together, they talk Swahili when they want to talk about all the outlaws or in-laws. But I want her to come and greet you, share what may be on her heart, on her mind, and then as soon as she's finished, we're gonna show a short video We'll say a few more things and then we're going to get into the Word of God. Amen. It is a pleasure to be at Cross Church today. 
and in, in the great state of Kansas and with the Blackburns, I feel very much at home. And the pipe and drape has a lot to do with that. <laughs> That's kind of a church planner's tool is the pipe and drape, and it just makes me feel at home. Um, this morning as we were singing, we were talk, the song was talking about he's done it before. He'll do it again. And as we are preparing to go back to Botswana, I was thinking there's so many things that have to be done. In a nation of 2.6 million, 34% of those are children under 14 years of age. That's a huge mission field. How are we going to do that? How are we going to reach the entire western side of Botswana? How are we going to spread this word? And I felt like God tell me, this is not going to be the thing I fail you at. He's done so many things. He's not going to let us down on this thing. What are you facing? What has he done for you in the past? But you're looking at something right now that looks so completely impossible. Think about it. There's so many things in our lives that we think God can never do it. I can't do it by myself. I need help. He's not going to stop now. He's done a lot in the past. He's done a lot for Crossroads. The future is bright because he's not going to fail now. Thank you for having us. God bless you. Thirty years ago, God called my wife and I to the nation of Botswana in southern Africa, where we entered into the AIM program of the United Pentecostal Church. During those early years, we saw so many miracles, so many things happen that the only thing you could say is God did it. Botswana is a beautiful country in the desert with the Kalahari Desert at its center very young country it's only 57 years old when i arrived there it was only 27 years old one of the greatest things that we were involved in was the starting of the learning center school in the capital city of haberoni to watch it start in literally in a garage and grow into a school of almost 700 students with over 100 employees absolutely amazing and when you go there today, and so many of those students are now members of government, there's doctors, there's lawyers, these are now business people that are, are doing tremendous things in that nation. The church in Gaborone started in our house, and it started growing, and it grew from the house to another location. And watching that grow from 15 to a church in the capital city, that was running near 1,000 in attendance at times. The revival that took place, the revival that we were privileged to be part of will be something we will never forget. And we are just delighted to have been a part of what God has done there in those early years. 15 years ago, God called us back to the United States to plant a church in the heart of New Haven, Connecticut, literally just blocks from a little school called Yale University. We quickly saw a revival happen. It was amazing to watch my children who had grown up in Africa learn how to navigate the American church and the American culture, but still be missionaries. It's a big piece of our life that we will never regret. What a privilege to be part of planning a church in that great city. Up until one year ago, we were pastoring two churches. We genuinely believed we were gonna spend the rest of our life in Connecticut with the church there, watching God do incredible things until God made it very, very clear we were to return to Botswana and continue the work that he had allowed us to be part of those many years ago. And as much as it grieved me because I loved 
the people of Connecticut and I loved what we were doing, I knew that we were being called back to Botswana. I knew it was time to go back to the people that I loved and a place that I knew that my husband was feeling the calling to go back to. So now we are returning to Botswana to continue the work that God allowed us to be part of those many years ago as fully appointed missionaries with the United Pentecostal Church. I know, I realize, I get it. All these years, going back, how in the world are you doing that? My, my response is pretty simple. There's no other place I'd rather be than in a land we love in a land we are called to with a people that we love so very, very much. Then to go work with a national superintendent that used to be part of your youth group. No place I'd rather be than right there doing the will of God, the work of God. I cannot wait to get there and see what God has for the remaining years in that nation. There's not just villages that have never heard this truth, but there's entire regions. The fact that those people have not even had an opportunity to accept or reject this truth, it's just unacceptable. I really do believe that God's sending us back to reach that nation because the time is short. If not now, then when? The time is now, the time is now for Botswana. The time is now for us to go back to Botswana, to the people that we love, and to the country that we call home. Everyone that is watching this presentation can be part of what God's doing and going to do in the nation of Botswana. And you can do that by simply committing once a month that you're gonna spend some time praying for the Perrys, praying for the nation of Botswana, praying for the church in Botswana. We also need individuals, churches, that will partner with us financially. Will you partner with us to see the mission happen in Botswana now? These are our people, and we're going home. Amen. Amen. If the children want to head to their service, and as they're going there, you'll see on the screen this QR code. If you're not fancy to that, you can text 7177 and then just put the name, the word Perry, our last name in that, and it'll bring up the same link that the QR code will take you to. And the reason I'm drawing your attention to that is God has been very good to us. How many know God's been good to you? Amen. And we have raised our financial base, uh, what we call PIMs, Partners in Missions. And we said this at camp meeting, we sure are not turning any away. So if pastor wants to partner with us financially, we'll be happy to receive that. But what we are really pushing for now is to build up what we call our evangelism fund. And these funds allow us to do different things in that nation. One of the most urgent needs is baptismal tanks. You see, Botswana is a, you could see a desert nation. And there are so many areas where on a map you will see a river, but there's no water in the river. It's just a dry, sandy riverbed. And in a lot of the villages where we have churches, there, there's no river to go to, there's no lake to go to to baptize people. They have gotten creative. They have these large water tanks that they cut in half. And I say large, but they're not large enough to, to actually baptize our more traditional way, but they have to dunk them and, and then they come up. So what we are striving to do, we have a man in the country that is willing to build a baptismal tanks for us. And the cost of supply is just over 300 US dollars and uh, close to $100 is his charge. These are made of steel. 
and uh, we are trying to raise as much as we can to buy a baptismal tank for every single church in the country, which is 14 churches. Two of them already have baptismal tanks, so we really just need 12 of them at $400. I believe after camp meeting, if I've heard right and it all comes in, I believe we've easily gotten funds for about five of those. So any part that you want to play in that, and as you go there, you'll see you fill out information, but there is a drop down that says, uh, I believe it says shipping, travel or airfare, and then evangelism. So you'd want to select evangelism. If it's $5, it helps. If it's $500, it'll more than buy a baptismal tank. If it's $5 million, I'm never traveling again. But don't give the $5 million through that. Amen. Talk to your pastor about that one. <laughs> Amen. But I, I do give honor to uh, your pastor. And uh, the Blackburns are just amazing people. And this environment excites us. Five years, and look what the Lord has done. Amen. It's awesome. It's awesome. And I just pray that when we hopefully come back through in another four to five years, we can be here and we can see another building. Amen. All right. And we can see more souls, more people. And I'll pray that, Sister, uh, my goodness, my brain, that Sister Blackburn doesn't have to leave and go work with the kids because there's some young somebody that got a hold of God and said, you know what, I, I feel a call to children's ministry. I'm praying that pastor won't be up here leading worship because there's a huge team of praise singers and people that have said, I'm committed to the cause of Christ. I want to be part of what God is doing. Plug me in, pastor. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you experienced this, but I was never a small child. I was young, but I was never small. So I was the kid on the, the playground that when we were doing kickball and I got lined up against the wall, I was, pick me, pick me, pick me, because nobody wanted the chubby kid. But boy, when they found out I could kick a home run every time, I was the first one to be picked. It, it took me a while to get around the bases, but okay, anyway, I'm just testing the crowd today. Amen. If you would, I'd like to turn to the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 3 through 4 is what we're going to read, and, and then we will turn to Matthew 15 and read from there, from verse 21 to 28 in just a few minutes, but I want to begin with a scripture from Romans that I... I will never forget when this first really jumped out to me, and I've heard this scripture most of my life, a certain part of it, but there's, there's a phrase in here that just grabbed me, and it, it, it kind of messed with me in a time in our planning a church in, in New Haven that I, I was just struggling, and I was questioning things, and I was frustrated, to be honest, and in my devotion, I, I came across this scripture. So I want to read this, and if you'll turn there, or if you're using the cheat sheet behind me, that's fine as well. But Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, it says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? You notice the question mark there. It goes on in verse 4 to say, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest, mightest overcome when thou art judged. A couple things from these two verses. First, we ended with, it says, when thou art judged, that we might overcome when we are judged. How many have found out that living for God, you're going to have people that judge you? You're going to go on your job, and when you're not, you're not cussing anymore, and you're not acting the fool anymore, people say, 
what's wrong with you? What happened to you? And they, they begin to judge you when you begin to tell them about your walk, your relationship, your experience with God. Or, or you have family members that say, oh, you're going to that church? You're going to one of those churches? And, and I, I've just come to encourage somebody today to say that you will be judged, but you will be justified in your sayings. Because there is only one Lord, there is only one faith, there is only one God, there is only one truth. And while I don't believe any organization has, has it capitalized, they don't, they don't have ownership of it, but I do believe that all of us have a responsibility, as we heard in the teaching today, to worship him in spirit and in truth. So I, I hope you hear the preacher today. I might get a little more excited. I might spit a little more. But, but I really believe God wants us to leave out of here saying, you know what, devil? It's all right. It's all right, devil. I believe in a God that hears me, that sees me, that knows me, that loves me. And it's okay if this world comes against me. I actually expect it to happen, but I have found a way. I found a way that God just seems to answer, that God just seems to respond. And I hope that we leave here today feeling that charge, feeling that excitement. Amen. But I read this scripture and I thought to myself, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? And pastor, I, I thought about that, the faith of God. I don't know how all of us think about God, but I don't believe I serve a God or the God that, that breathed life into my lungs. I don't believe the God that I serve that I believe created the heavens and the earth, that he spoke it and it was. I don't believe that that God had to get himself all wild and excited or lock himself away so that his faith could be increased for him to do what he did. I just frankly don't believe, and I, I haven't got too deep in the theology of it, but I don't believe God has faith in the sense that we have faith. Right. You're real quiet. No habla espanol. But I, I believe in a God that when he says it's so, it, hey, there we are. Got out of the light. That when he says it's so, it is so. I believe in a God that when he says, you are okay, then you are okay. I, I believe in a God that when he says, you're healed, you're healed. I, I believe in a God that when he speaks, it is. I, I don't believe in a God that I got to come to church or I got to go about my life just wishing he would do something. I, I just believe in a God that does it the way he desires to do it. And my role and my responsibility is to simply live the life that he wants me to live, desires me to live. So here in the Romans, we're, we're reading that text, and I, I thought to myself, self, this doesn't really make sense. I don't get this, the faith of God. And I, I, I did what any good-looking, young, intelligent preacher would do. All right, some got it. Some just kept a straight face. And I got on my computer, Pastor Blackburn, and I, I pushed a few buttons. And, and what I discovered very quickly, if I would read another version of the Scripture besides the King James, many versions have already translated it the way it reads in the original language. Because in the original, this faith of God literally is the faithfulness of God. Oh, somebody needs to hear that right now. So no matter what I'm going through, no matter how much I doubt, no matter how much they doubt, no matter how much I question things, no matter how much the world questions this God stuff, the fact of the matter is it doesn't matter if they believe or not. It does not take away from the faithfulness of God. Somebody should get a smile on your face because it will not take away the faithfulness of God. Yes, it's been a rough week. It's been a rough month. It's been a rough year. Maybe things are not going the way you think. And maybe people are telling you it's because you're cursed or this or that. Can I just tell you, I don't want to hear any of that because none of it will take away from the faithfulness of God. My God has been 
faithful. My God will remain faithful. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if that is true, he is still the faithful God. Somebody today needs to walk out of here saying, all right, devil, I don't care what you bring my way. I don't care what you're trying to say. I don't care what you're trying to do in my home, in my family, my job, my life. I am going to worship the faithful God. That's all good and exciting, but there's a story in Matthew chapter 15. I want to read verse 21. Pastor actually referenced the story in his teaching this morning. And if you missed the teaching this morning, you missed some good stuff. Amen. I love preaching. I love getting all excited, but there's nothing like getting into the Word of God and learning and growing. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I'll see you next week at 10 o'clock right here. Now, don't lie. You're in the house of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, That was free, Pastor. I'm just, you know, yeah. Amen. So here in the the book of Matthew 15, this is a story that many of us are probably familiar or we've heard portions of it. But rather than just tell the story, I want to quickly read it. And it's from Matthew 15, starting at verse 21. And it says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre, and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered her, or but he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. She said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. The story of the Canaanite woman. I don't know if you're familiar with with what a Canaanite was. A Canaanite was not necessarily a nationality, but Canaanites were a group of people. In modern day today, they would be from the area of of Jordan and and of Palestine and and that area. And, And they were a people almost that were nomads and And this woman was one that typically, you kind of like some of the teaching, the woman at the well, typically the Jews would not look very well upon her. And here the disciples are with Jesus in this space they were in. And this Canaanite woman has this daughter vexed with the devil. And she, I just have a feeling because of the culture of that day and knowing a little bit about it, that she probably had tried everything she knew to try to have her daughter delivered from this devil. I I just have a feeling she probably tried every kind of traditional medicine, as we would call it in Africa. I think the more modern language is witchcraft. And she she had no luck. And, And now she heard about this Jesus. And something in her said, if I can just get to this Jesus, I'm believing that everything's going to be okay. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a child vexed with a devil. Any parents here? If you're a parent, would you just lift your hand? You, you have children? All right, I want to know the audience that I'm okay. So there's enough of us that I think you know the feeling. My wife and I have two children, a son and a daughter. My daughter's the oldest son, the youngest. And, and we would do anything, Brother Brown, for our children. I, I would do whatever I had to do for my children. Even today, I still will do whatever I can do for my children. And in those years that we were in Botswana previously, there wasn't a lot of uh, shopping. There was not a lot of places to go to buy our kids clothes. There certainly were no toys. And uh, (laughs) there was no ice cream most of the time. It was just awful. But when we would come home to the States, Pastor, We would save up every penny we could because we were going to stock up on clothes for the kids. We would maybe buy a toy for them from us, but grandparents took care of most of that. But I'll never forget the day, and 
being a PK, I don't ever, I try not to use my children's names and use them in illustrations, and, and I, I'm not going to use their name to tell you which one, but she would, <laughs> she would throw these fits, and I'll never forget, we were in a Toys R Us, and I dared to say no. She threw herself on the floor and began to kick, scream, yell, I want it, Dad, but I want And I picked her up, and I put her in the shopping cart, and I said, girl, if you don't want to be locked up another week, you will not do that. And then my wife comes over and says, you've got to stop saying stuff like that. They're going to arrest you. And I said, how are they going to find me? We live in the Kalahari Desert. Good luck. But for the record, we never locked our children up, okay? But while my daughter was not vexed with the devil, she was vexed with herself, I can't imagine what this Canaanite woman was going through. And I, I, even in that situation with my daughter, my heart, you know, I'm a, I'm a softie. She, she is daddy's girl, and I, I want to get her anything she wants. But I, in that moment, I don't know what came over me. I just said no. But this Canaanite woman was not in that situation. She was in a situation where she was desperate for something to change in her situation. She was desperate for God to do something to change the situation. And you may be here today and you've got all these problems and you think just coming to the house of God is going to solve those problems or, or saying, Pastor, would you put me on the prayer list? I, I, I believe in prayer and I believe that God answers prayer, but there's something that happens when we get desperate for God to do something in the situation. When something changes in us and says, I've got to get to Jesus. And here in this story, and I hope this is all right, that, that I just kind of hang here for a minute because this Canaanite woman has taught me so much because this Canaanite woman comes and she's in the presence of Jesus and she cries out to him. And I was in this spot in my life, in my ministry. I'd been crying out to him. I'd been fasting. I'd been seeking for God to speak. And just like so often in my life, Pastor, he is, he is just so quick to, to respond this way. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Silent. I need to hear from you, Lord. Silent. The Canaanite woman's got a, a daughter vexed with a devil. She's desperate, and she, she pleads her case, and she cries out to him, and he is silent. I don't know about you, but where I come from, if I, if I speak to you and you don't speak back, that's a problem. I probably am not going to want much to do with you. Or I'm going to assume you're on some kind of medication or... Okay, hallelujah, praise God. So Jesus is silent. So what, what blows my mind next is that the disciples come to Jesus and say, Lord, send her away. The disciples come to Jesus and say, send her away. She's annoying us. She's bothering us. I don't know if you caught that. The disciples want her gone. The disciples say, she doesn't know how we do things around here. The disciples are saying, Lord, she's bothering us. And, and I, I think about that, and I think about some stories, and we don't have time for it, but of the people that came through the doors of our church and in inner city, and, and there were some characters. But I wonder sometimes, Pastor, what would happen to some of them had they been treated a little different, if they were made to feel welcome, if they, they were told, hey, come in and sit with me, and, and let's worship the Lord together. What do you need today? Let's get you close to Jesus. But that was not the case here. And it, it, it disturbs me to think about it. And I'm going to come back to that because I really do believe it was a matter of perspective. I really do believe that this Canaanite woman was desperate for God to do something. I, I, I hope this is all right, Pastor. I got a little soapbox that I'm going to jump on for a minute. But I am so tired of hearing about church hurt. I'm so tired of going online and people typing in the way about how they were hurt at this church and why they don't go to church anymore. I think this was the first case of true church hurt. Can you imagine? You're desperate. You need help. 
Jesus is silent. That would hurt. And then his followers come to him and say, would you get rid of her? Hmm. How would you respond? Well, I, I'm hurt. I don't get it. I don't under, I believe in church. If you want to talk church hurt, if you got a couple days, I'd love to sit down with you and tell you how much I've been hurt by the church. It's real. It exists. But what I find amazing is that people will leave the church. Young people hear this missionary today. People will run away from the church. They will leave the church because of church hurt. Where else are you going to find church hurt but in the church? Uh, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. How many times have you heard about hypocrites in the church? I literally have had people say, I don't go to church. I don't believe in organized religion. There's so many hypocrites. Where else are you going to find hypocrites but in the church? Okay, I'm just trying to help somebody. But what blows my mind is that I never saw what I saw in this scripture. The Canaanite woman's response to the perceived hurt was not one of exit, but it was one of exaltation. It was one where she said, I hear the disciples and I, I don't see your mouth moving, Jesus, but I know what you want from me and I have a revelation in my desperation of who you are and even if you remain silent, even if your disciples want me to leave, what did the scripture say? We read it. Then she came worshiping. There's something that happens in the atmosphere when things are not going right, when we don't think it's playing out the way it should, that if we'll just come to him and worship him, if we'll just get our eyes locked on Jesus and say, Lord, whether you heal my daughter or not, I'm going to be a worshiper of you. Lord, whether your disciples want me here or not, I'm going to be a worshiper of you. Somebody hear this today. I'm not going to be much longer. We don't don't have time for you to figure it all out but I do believe God's wanting someone to hear this today that before you leave out of here you say you know what devil I'm tired of the lies and the distraction I'm tired of your nonsense in my home I'm tired of your attack on my life it's a distraction I'm getting my eyes on Jesus pastor and I'm going to be a worshiper I'm going to come to the house of God and I'm going to lift my hands I'm going to lift my voice when I wake up on Monday morning I'm going to say thank you Lord for another day I celebrate you Jesus I'm a worshiper of you Jesus there's something that happens when we worship I'm not discrediting any other you know, prayer time. I'm not discrediting other things we know in Scripture. But what I have found is that there's something about worship. Worship keeps me focused on the, the priority, on, on the one that I live for. I don't, I don't know if you've ever experienced death in your immediate family, but I remember just a few years ago my mother passing away. She was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer on election day, spoke her last words on that Sunday. It was quick, and I am thankful. I'll just let you think about that for a minute. But I will never forget the night that I put my hands on her head and I prayed and I said, Lord, you're a miracle working God. Lord, I know you can raise her up out of this and you can heal and give her a new pancreas. You can take all the cancer out, Lord. I know that you're a miracle working God. And as I prayed, I said, whether the miracle be on this side or that side, do a quick work, Lord. And she breathed her last breath that evening. It was not really the prayer that I was wanting to be answered. I really wanted it to be on this side. I really wanted mom around because she certainly was not old. And I, I, I'll never forget that, but I said, God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that she didn't have to suffer. 
Thank you, Lord, that you didn't drag that out. Thank you, Lord, that you took her where she wanted to be. Her last words were, Rick, I'm just tired and I want to go home. She wasn't talking about 19675 Sagamore Hills Road. She was talking about home. And I come today just to tell somebody, you got to make up your mind that you're going to worship him no matter how the prayer is answered or not answered. you got to make up your mind that you're going to live for him no matter what comes your way way. This Canaanite woman taught us all a lesson, how to be a worshiper. She worships him and his response. He responds. He speaks. Sometimes, just like my mother, his response is not quite what we would like to hear. His response to this Canaanite woman was, you dog. I don't know. I had a brief interaction with Brother Brown, said he's from Dayton. I got a feeling it's a lot like Cleveland where I was raised, that area. You call me a dog, you better be my homie. Because if you're not, it's on like Donkey Kong. Some of y'all don't even remember Donkey Kong. Anyway, I, I, I can't imagine. This is Jesus. And he just called me a dog. But you see, when your perspective's right, when you're a worshiper, she responds by saying, oh yeah, I'm a dog. But even a dog gets the crumb. You see, I believe Pastor Blackburn, she, she approached the Messiah like a dog. She was coming to him looking up while the disciples that wanted her gone had been sitting around and feasting and they'd been looking down at what was prepared for them. She didn't really know what all was on the table. She didn't really know what all she could have from him. But she was looking up at him and saying, Lord, I may be but a dog, but I know if I can just get a crumb. You see this thing called doubt. I want us to consider his faithfulness today. Your unbelief will not take away from the faithfulness of God. The fact that you feel like you failed him, it does not take away from the faithfulness of God. The fact that you feel like you can't ever live this life, it does not take away from the faithfulness of your God. Your unbelief. <laughs> I seem to recall Adam and Eve and the forbidden fruit. I, I seem to recall Cain and Abel and the wrong sacrifice, and a murder takes place. I, I, I recall Moses and Aaron. If you know these stories, there's so many examples, but, but Aaron gives in and, and builds an idol because Moses is still up on the mountain. I, I have a feeling Aaron said, this is all I know to do, so I'm going to do it because Moses is probably dead up there. He probably got eaten by a, a, a lion. And you got Samson and Delilah, and Deli Samson gives in to the ploys of Delilah. And, you know, there's a moral to that story, if you know it. And and it's just simply this, don't let your girlfriend cut your hair. <laughs> David and Bathsheba, if you know the story, you know the story. David, not only an adulterer, but a murderer. Peter, Peter preached the greatest message ever preached in Acts chapter 2. But yet, Peter was the one that denied him, not once, twice, but three times. But yet, God remained faithful to them. I am so thankful that my doubt, that my unbelief did not take away from the faithfulness of my God. Would you stand with me? There's a story as you're standing that I want to share from, that I read about from the end of World War II. And the story goes as the liberators were clearing Cologne, Germany, they went into a particular cellar of one of the homes and they found etched on the walls these words. It said, I believe. I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love even when I feel it not. And I believe in God even when He is silent. I've come to encourage some awesome people right here be a worshiper of him even if he's silent 
Get your eyes on Him and keep your eyes on Him. No matter how much you begin to doubt or you begin to struggle, just be a worshiper because He responds to worship. So often unbelief creeps in because of the voice of the masses, Aaron. Frustration, Moses. The seduction of sin, Samson. The lust of the flesh, David. Peter, you watched your leader's dreams just come tumbling down. It's easy to doubt. It's easy to get sidetracked. But oh, the Canaanite woman. She said, I don't care what's going on. I have seen Jesus. And he is here. And I'm going to worship him no matter what. If you're here and you've been struggling and perhaps this is something that is new to you. Pastor mentioned it. He taught on it this morning. God's looking for people that will live a life of repentance unto Him. I believe that the Scripture is true. That if we ask Him to forgive, He is faithful and just to forgive. So in just a moment, I'm going to invite everybody that would to come to this front area, this altar. And we're going to repent together. Because I've got a feeling there's some like me that I have an experience with Him, but I, I often doubt and I struggle. I struggle. And I need to be like this Canaanite woman and say, I'm going to be a worshiper of you. Because once you've repented of your sins, the Scripture says, He will forgive. And once I repent of my sins, I can lift my hands and begin to worship Him. I can begin to tell Him how awesome He is, how mighty He is. I, I can thank Him that I can feel His presence, that I, I, I could get excited about the fact that He's real in my life. And as I worship Him, I begin to feel something all over my body. And I begin to feel something on my lips. And I can't put it any other way but this way. That when God takes control of my tongue, he has taken control of what the scripture says is the most unruly member of the body. It's a sign that his spirit has control of this flesh. Sounds a little strange. It is a little strange. But oh, what a feeling. How many know the joy of the Holy Ghost? So right now, those that would, I want to invite everybody. I can't think of a better way to end a service than by way of the altar by way of coming forward together with other believers. And as you come and step as close as you can so we can make room, I promise I'm not going to do anything crazy. I can't vouch for anyone else, but I'm pretty sure you're in a safe place. But I wonder, would you just join us up here? Amen. And what I want us to do is just begin to pray, pray a prayer of repentance. What is that? I'm praying and I'm saying, Lord, I want to walk after you. I don't want the sin in my life anymore. I often pray as David prayed, search me, O oh Lord. See if there be a wicked way. I, I want God to show me if there's sin in my life I'm not aware of. And I repent of that. So as we repent together, would you just trust the word? Would you believe that he's forgiving you? Would you cry out to him, Lord, search me? Would you begin to lift your hands and your voice all over this place? Lord, I thank you, God, for what I feel in this place. I thank you, Lord, for your spirit, God. Lord, I've come in here a little weary, God. Forgive me, Lord, God, for not trusting you. Forgive me, Lord, for my unbelief. Forgive me, God, for my doubt. But Lord, I'm thankful for your faithfulness. I'm thankful, Lord, that you've been faithful to me. Hallelujah. As you've repented and as you feel some of that lifting from you. Hallelujah. I pray you begin to worship. I pray you begin to cry out to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Feel free to ask someone to pray with you if you want. But I believe God wants to fill somebody with his spirit. I believe God wants his church leaving here today. Say no. I'm a worshiper of you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Hallelujah.